Some people believe the weatherman and some people don't. Only job I know where you can be wrong 80% of the time and still have a job. Hey, I know All right. Since it's me uh, leading the music tonight, you know what that means, right? Old rock and roll songs put, I mean, praising the Lord songs put to old rock and roll tunes, all right? The first one you might recognize was originally called Johnny Be Good. It was for us, he lived in 
176 weeks in a row with at least one motorcycle. The weather was a little sketchy, but thank you for riding. Those of you who did, I appreciate it. We're going to Dee Dee's Dairy tonight, and if you've never been to Dee Dee's Dairy before, I recommend, unless you have a huge appetite, you order a small. Okay? Everything's enormous. Though. And uh, money only. Bikers at the bakery, you know, the summer's slipping away, you know. Not many more chances to be bikers at the bakery on Wednesday night. Uh, so we hope that you will, that we will see you there. Um, this is my last, this is my uh, wife's last bikers at the bakery before she's done working for Niagara County. Takes about three weeks off and then starts working for our son and his wife babysitting. So she's just switching jobs really. Is that it? No. Oh no, man. The most important one of the night. August 31st, walking and wagon, fifth annual walk is on. Come and walk. If you don't have a dog, stay for the tailgate party. We have a church service and pop up. 11:30 dog blessing and dog walk. We're looking for people to uh, sponsor those who are walking. If you are walking, uh, thank you. And one of the things I've been telling my folks here on Sunday morning is we've got a lady here who's in her 60s who's got two knee replacements. And she's going to walk a mile and a half. So what's your excuse for not walking? Whatever it is, it's not a good one. Okay. All right. If you're working, I'll accept that as an excuse. But you paid. You gave me money. She gave me. All right. And I'm telling everybody else they're going to give me five if they're not walking. So uh, Colleen was very generous. She gave me twenty-five dollars. She sponsored me. So what I'm asking people to do is, if you can won't walk, penalize yourself five bucks and sponsor somebody who is, okay? All right, now we're done, right? All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're having to turn things over to the correct man tonight. My boy, Benson. The correct man. The correct man. Oh, you're the correct man. Or the fitting Nick for tonight, because it's on the schedule. Okay, so, we've been going through the Gospel of John uh, all throughout the summertime. And in the Gospel of John, we've dealt a lot with who Jesus is because that Gospel deals a lot with who Jesus is. And we make no complaints about what our agenda is. We're not scared of claiming what our agenda is. It's real simple. We're a church. We claim Jesus. And because we claim Jesus, we also claim that we need salvation. Everyone needs salvation. That's our main message. Of course, there's a lot entailed with, you know, what's salvation? Why do you need it? Blah, blah, blah. All that stuff. But the main gist of why this is open and why we're here is because we need Jesus because he gives us salvation. And it's because we need salvation in the first place. That is our objective. In tonight's chapter, which is John chapter 14, it starts out with kind of addressing that. And it says that Jesus, Jesus says of himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And the whole point of the Christian faith is to bring us human beings back to God to the point where Adam and Eve were in, where we have intimacy with God. The only way to do that is through Jesus Christ. And that's our message. Jesus Christ alone, no one else. All right? But aside from that, tonight... We're going to talk about what happens after you come to God. See, we've been dealing a lot with what, why you need Jesus, who Jesus is. But once you accept him as the way, the truth, and the life, then what? Now, most people will say, then what? I'll tell you what. I'm a Christian. I was saved. I heard the gospel in the church once, or I heard the gospel in the revival, or I heard the gospel on the street, and here's what happened. God saved me, and then here's what I did. I, became, I either have a cleaner heart, or uh, I have better relationships in my whole life, or I gave up drugs. You know what? That's all great. I love that. Personal testimonies are beautiful. But here's what's interesting. When you hear someone give a personal testimony, all too often it goes from God saved me, and then this is what happened to me. What I want to deal with tonight, though, is real simple. God saved me, and then this is what God did after he saved me. We're not going to talk about what happened to us so much as what we're going to say when we're talking about what God does after he saves someone. A really good question is this. What does God do after he saves someone initially, right? What is his next step? We always like planning stuff out. I plan a lot of stuff out in my life. I want to know the next step and what I'm supposed to do in whatever I'm doing. Well, what's God's next step 
after he saved somebody, after somebody accepted, accepts that Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. So we're going to talk about that tonight. And what is it that's the next step? Well, God says that he's going to, through Jesus, he's going to allow us to be able to do greater works than Jesus. Now, I'm not going to get into that tonight. But it's based upon a question that we have to ask of God. Because Jesus, in John chapter 14, says that you will do greater works than I to glorify the Father through me. And then he says, whatever you ask for in my name, I will do for you. And that's what we're going to deal with tonight. John 14, verses 13 and 14. Let's just deal with verse 13. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. So now you may ask, well, Nick, you just got done telling us what is God going to do after he saves somebody. And now you're referencing Jesus telling us what we have to do. Well, you have to understand, as soon as God saves a human being, then he says, I'm going to put a question before you that I want you to ask me. Okay? He initiates a process where we question God and we ask him something. Can you give us anything? But it's got to be in Jesus' name. So he literally begins a line of communication. It's like God says, okay, I saved you. Now I'm going to call you up, right? And now we're going to talk, okay? And you're going to ask me the question first. You're going to ask me whatever you want to ask me in Jesus' name. That is God responding right after he saves a human being. Now what's interesting about that is this. Ask and I will do whatever you ask. I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. That first part, I, I will do whatever you ask in my name. I will do whatever, whatever, whatever. A lot of traditions in Christianity look at those words and they say, well, there it is. That's it. We'll do whatever we want. There it is. You ask for cancer to be healed, he'll do it. You ask for this or that, he'll do it. No. There's clarifications in that sentence. There's more to that sentence than just ask for whatever you want, I'll do for whatever. God is not a genie. Because in that sentence, there's more than what a genie does. A genie just gives you whatever you ask for. This is not a genie. This is a God that says, in my name. But before we get to that part, we got to understand, going back to what I'm talking about, God wants to open up the line of communication in the first place. He wants to call us up and start talking with us. So the picture that Jesus gives in John chapter 14 is this. Okay, you're saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And therefore, if you accept it, you will be saved. I am the one that's bringing you to the Father. I will glorify the Father through me, and you will be reconciled to the Father. And that's great. And then he opens up the line of communication. Because what is he going to do? He, in that time, is going to go away into heaven and sit at the right hand of the Father. And then he will give the Holy Spirit down and bring them down and put them inside his followers. Now, what's beautiful about that is that that, when the moment the person starts to talk to Jesus who's up in heaven, what do we call that? Prayer. Praying. And before we ever get to the point of God giving us whatever we want in his name, we have to first address the fact that he wants us to talk to him in the first place. Now, someone might say, Nick, Nick, come on, I know this. This is, this is milk, and I need meat. Let's start talking about that. Clarify what's meant by ask whatever, and whatever you want in my name. I want to get to the meaty part. The meaty part is at the very beginning. We have to start getting to the point as Christians where we emphasize prayer so much that sometimes we forget what we're praying for. What is greater? The crumbs that fall from the table of the master or the master himself? That's an image Jesus used. Right? Now, even more so, um, I, uh, 
On a personal note, I have prayed for stuff in my life and I've not gotten it. And I always like that song by Garth Brooks, where he's saying, there's a song, God, God, Unanswered Prayer, it's called. You know, some of God's greatest gifts are unanswered prayer. So you look at that song and the theology in that song and you line it up with that verse and you say, it's kind of inconsistent there. No, it's not. It's not inconsistent. Because sometimes when we talk to God and we pray for something that's not in his name, it's not actually prayer. Prayer is something where we talk to God and it's according to what God wants, not always what we want. Because he's the king and we're not the king or the queen in our lives. You see, my method of prayer, and I think Jesus really knew this well in the Garden of Gethsemane, was this. I pray, I, I use prayer to get, the gift of prayer to get to God. I do not use prayer to get God's gifts. Okay? I use the gift of prayer itself to get to God himself, who is the ultimate giver of everything. I use prayer to get to the one who is the master at his table. I'm not worried about the crumbs as much as I'm worried about the one who gives those crumbs in the first place. Prayer is an open line of communication with God. And this is not just milk. This is meat. And if you, if you don't believe me, just go right to the part in the Bible where Jesus after he's betrayed by one of his followers, or before he's betrayed by one of his followers, he's praying, God, Father, help me not get to this cross, please. But nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And the ultimate goal, that entire work that he did on the, on, on, on the earth, ending in the cross, and then in the resurrection, was so that he could get back to his father and so that the two of them could make their home with us, which is at the end of John chapter 14. The whole goal is for Jesus to bring us to the father and the father to us. That's why he's the one who reconciles us with the father. Now, I wanted to do that. My whole agenda was to get us to the point where we understand that when we read those words, it needs to be God-oriented, not me-oriented. Now, when I say that, I do not mean that we cannot pray for anything. We can pray for anything we want. We can pray for cancer to be healed. We can pray for just anything we want. But here's the thing. We've got to make sure that's in line with God's will. We've got to make sure that's in line with God's commandments. As anything in my name. That's the part that clarifies what we are to ask for. In my name. Now, when I was younger... I remember this one incident where I was on, this, on the roof of a hotel on Niagara Falls Boulevard. I'm not going to tell you what hotel it was, but we could climb up to this one roof, and this is one spot where you go up this pipe, and me and my friend Mike, we took, we took a bunch of rocks, and we literally chucked it over the hotel onto the cars that were going by on Niagara Falls Boulevard. Now, I, part of me is kind of scared that someday I will have a rock hit my car when I'm an older man or something. And, you know, kind of this payment for what I did when I was a young, stupid kid, when I was about 12 or 13. And what's funny is, my mom the one day, it's like, I heard from a little birdie that you were throwing rocks at cars. <laughs> and, uh, oh my gosh, I was red in the face. I felt so bad. I'm like, how did you hear? Who told you? And she's like, it doesn't matter. How dare you? I got lectured bad, okay? And then I remember one thing my dad said. He said this a lot. You represent the Bensons. That's my last name is Benson, by the way, just to clarify. You represent the Bensons. Do not dishonor our name. Do not dishonor our name. So if I were to ask my dad for money, and it's not within his name because it was like I asked him for money to buy rocks to throw at cars, he would never give me money. Why? Because it dishonors his name. Right? It goes against his name. His name represents his reputation. His reputation represents who he is and what his, his character is. It's the same way with God. We can't ask things in Jesus' name that is not, that's going to be inconsistent with Jesus' reputation and the Father's reputation. Ask whatever in my name means. You can ask whatever, so long as this is consistent with his will, his name, his reputation, his kingdom, his, and the whole work that Jesus did. 
So when you hear about people talking about prayer and they ask for all sorts of things, if, they, if their prayer is not aligned with God's will, it's not a real prayer. God may hear them. He's, I, he's all hearing. He can, he can hear everything. He's not going to listen like children, though. The real children of God are the people that pray according to the Father's will in the name of Jesus Christ. And Jesus set the perfect example for us to understand that. To understand that whatever we ask for in the Father's name will be, well actually in the Son's name, will be done for us. And if we ask anything in the Son's name, it's according to the Father's will. Because the Father and the Son are united. Last but not least, let me clarify something. What is the answer, the final answer that's given in John chapter 14? What is the gift that's given after all this talk about prayer and all the works that you would do if you're a believer? It's the Holy Spirit. Jesus goes away from earth to the right hand of the Father. The Father then and the Son, according to the power of the Holy Spirit, makes their home within the human being. And all three, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the family of God is indwelling within us. That is the gift and answer of the prayer that we find in John chapter 14. And of course, that's consistent with His will. But we got to understand that our prayers need to be God-oriented first. And everything that we ask for concerning ourselves has to be couched within that, under that umbrella of what does God want? What does He really want? Is it what something that he wants? So, and then in the name of Jesus, let's pray. Let's all stand, please. Father, you are strange to us if we don't know your son. Your son reveals you to us, and you are a loving father, and you will give us anything we ask for. But we ask in Jesus' name that you please help us to ask for the right things. Please align our questions and whatever we ask for according to what you desire, because we know, at least some of us, that what you desire is better for us than what we might desire. So give us the strength to ask that. We pray these things in your Son's name.